Good morning to everybody and welcome. Um, sorry we got off to a little bit of a late start, but uh, we'll make up for it. Um, let me just uh, start by saying uh, welcome to the uh, Austin P. Board of Trustees third meeting of 2017. Um, we're glad to have every, everyone here. I would remind the trustees or people at the U-shaped table, make sure your microphone is on, please, when you make a comment so everyone can hear. And with that, I'll ask the secretary to please call the roll. Trustee Atkins. Present. Trustee Kanata. Present. Trustee Carroll. Present. Trustee Jenkins. Present. Trustee Luck. Trustee May. Present. Trustee Miller. Present. Trustee O'Malley. Present. Trustee Rayburn. Present. Trustee Willinius. Present. Have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, since we amended the bylaws at our May 19th meeting to permit the use of a consent agenda, please note that there are items on your agenda that need to be adopted. Before I call for a vote, are there any items you wish to be extracted from the consent agenda? So I move for adoption of the agenda, uh, including the consent agenda items. Is there a second? Second. Second by Trustee Atkins. Um, All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Um, the minutes for the May 19th, 7, 2017 board meeting and the special called meeting on August 3rd were circulated in advance of the meeting. Are there any corrections or additions mm -hmm. to the minutes? Yes, I'd like to make corrections to the May 19th minutes. Okay. My request for the mandatory fees was not represented correctly in the minutes. So right now it reads, Trustee Willenius requested that the board reject the approval of the athletics fee since not all students use the athletics facilities and equipment and should not be charged for services they do not benefit from. I would like for that to read instead, Trustee Willenius requested that the board reject the approval of the athletics fee increase because the overall increase was steep with regards to the current fee not all students have the authorization to use the athletics facilities and equipment, which should minimize their financial responsibility to the athletics department. And that's it. Further discussion? So I guess we need to ask for a approval of the adjustment? Yeah, adoption of the minutes. With okay. With the okay. So I'd ask for uh, approval of, uh, or adoption of the minutes with Crystal's uh, adjustment to her statement. Do I hear a second? Second. Uh, seconded by uh, General Mueller. So are, there any, are there any additional discussion? Chairman, I'm not sure exactly what we're doing here. Are we changing the minutes? Proposing to change the minutes to include the comments that Crystal just read. I would like for it to read that Trustee Willenius requested that the board reject the approval of the athletics fee increase because the overall increase was steep with regards to the current fee. Not all students have the authorization to use the athletics facilities and equipment, which should minimize their financial responsibility to the athletics department. So all in favor of the minutes with the noted corrections by Trustee Wolinius, uh, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, thank you. At this time, I'd like to recognize President White, who will introduce individuals from the Center of Service for, for Service Learning to provide us with a campus spotlight. The purpose of the campus spotlight is to introduce in some detail an area of the university uh, so that by the time you finish your terms on the board, you'll have a, a much closer look at university operations. So we're going to do one of these each board meeting. Last time, we dealt with the Grasslands Initiative. And today, you're going to hear um, about our service learning uh, program. 
But in the same spirit of introducing more of the university to you, before I introduce Dr. Bird, I'd like to take a moment to introduce some of our deans and directors to you. I'm going to do that now, and then some of them will go to work. <laughs> so please stand, if you would, as I call your name. Dr. Chad Brooks, Interim Dean, College of Graduate Studies. Dr. Prentice Chandler, Dean. Martha Dickerson Erickson, College of Education. Dr. David Denton, Dean, College of Behavioral and Health Sciences. Dr. Tim Hudson, Interim Executive Director, Center for Extended and International Education. Dr. Karen Meisch, Interim Dean, College of Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. Dr. Charles Moses, Interim Dean, College of Business. Dr. Dr. Dixie Webb, Dean, College of Arts and Letters. Joe Weber, Director, Felix G. Woodward Library. And you've already met Dr. Christine Nakudis, Executive Director of the APSU Center at Fort Campbell, and she's not able to be here today. Dr. Loretta Griffey, Associate Provost for Student Success. Dr. Lynn Crosby, Vice Provost, and Dr. Beverly Boggs, Associate Provost for Enrollment Management and Academic Support, who is working in her office right now. And Dr. Jaime Taylor, Presidential Fellow for 2017 and 18. Most of you know Dr. Taylor from his role as uh, Dean of the College of STEM, but I've asked him to help me strategize funding for uh, a long-term potential change in the state formula funding. So he's working with me this year on a special project. And now Dr. Cheryl Bird, Vice President for Student Affairs, will come now to introduce our presenters for this meeting's Campus Spotlight. Thank you. Good morning. It's a privilege to be able to share with you one of the uh, departments in the Division of Student Affairs. The Center for Service Learning and Community now know it, began as simply a program emphasis in the Office of Student Life. As more agencies sought volunteers and more students were willing to volunteer, the opportunities for service in the community grew. A major turning point was the establishment of a food pantry six years ago by two graduate students in the School of Social Work in conjunction with their graduate program. In need of a location for the food pantry, they partnered with the Office of Student Life to convert a supply closet into the food pantry. Well, fortunately, the use of the pantry grew quickly as students learned about it and had the need for the services. Unfortunately, it outgrew the space, but we were able to relocate it to a two-bedroom apartment in Emerald Hills. Again, it outgrew the space, and we had added clothes and household items to what could be um, assisted students. So when the house at 322 Home Avenue became available, this was a former fraternity house right, right up here, um, it was decided that we would use that location as, this, as the uh, home for the Center for Service Learning and Community Engagement. It officially opened in the fall of 2015 at that location, and the programs and services offered to students continues to evolve well beyond the initial food pantry. So it's my pleasure to introduce the director, Alexandra Wills. Her vision for what we should be doing and could be doing is really the reason this department and this program existed. She developed and nurtured her responsibility in the Office of Student Life with volunteer programs into the center, which you'll learn more about today. Um, as uh, Cheryl said, I'm Alexandra Wills. I've been working with Austin P for about eight years now, kind of developing uh, the service component at Austin P and working with our community to figure out the ways we can best work together uh, for a mutual beneficial um, success with our students in our community. Um, we passed out previously a very colorful booklet uh, that talks about the previous year that we've had. Um, so. Several of the areas I'll be talking about are highlighted in that booklet for, for future reference if you'd like to look back. So, well, we're very excited to be here today. This is Cassie Meadows. She's a uh, sophomore social work major at Austin P, and she has participated in several of our programs through our office. So I'm going to give her an opportunity to talk shortly about uh, her experience with us. So she's also very excited. The Center for Service Learning and Community Engagement, let's see, there we go, um, it exists uh, to provide the space and opportunity for students to become active citizens in their community by making their mark on the world. 
uh, as uh, previously said, were actually the neighbor. If you, if you could look out these windows, uh, you would probably see some chickens running around uh, behind a house. It's a little white house with a red door, um, and the logo you see is kind of our, uh, how we're known on campus. Um, so we are staffed with two full-time professional staff members, an administrative support person, and then three AmeriCorps VISTAs. So AmeriCorps VISTAs are the domestic version of the Peace Corps. They are individuals who dedicate a year, up to three years of their life, uh, volunteering in communities within the country. And we are proud to have three of them uh, that we uh, house within our office, and we place them out into the community working with different nonprofits. Um, so we have three of them working with our office as well. All right, so we have a very long title, the Center for Service Learning and Community Engagement. That's a lot of words. Um, but I'll start off with uh, the first big word. So service learning. Uh, we support uh, the teaching tool of service learning uh, as a collaboration between academics with faculty members and then our community uh, nonprofits. So a service learning class, because uh, they are regular classes on campus, combines 12 to 15 hours of volunteer work in the community with what students are learning within a specific service learning class. So the work that they're doing has to be directly tied to the uh, course objectives within that course. So it's not you're volunteering at the local animal shelter answering the phone, it's you are working specifically uh, within the skills that you're learning in your class. Um, they have to be directly tied to the work that you're doing within the community. We have over 50 courses at Austin P that are designated as service learning. Um, and our office uh, kind of acts as a matchmaker. So we work with faculty, understand what their course is about, and then we work in the community, and we find nonprofit agencies who have a need for those specific skills. And so we kind of match them together. Um, so we have around 300 students on average a semester who take service learning classes. So that is a lot of students to be putting into the community every semester. And um, we're really proud of the effect that they're able to have uh, in the community. But they don't just work locally. We have students that are working uh, across the country digitally, also internationally. So they're able to spread uh, their wealth of time and skills um, uh, beyond just Clarksville. So I wanted to give you some examples and highlight some of the great service learning classes that we have happening at Austin P. Um, so we have uh, on the screen Ceramics 3. Uh, this is a course uh, where students who are more uh, skilled in ceramics, hopefully by uh, Ceramics 3, uh, they're working on uh, kind of mass producing uh, their ceramics. And so we have them working with several programs uh, there's the Empty Bowls program in Clarksville. Uh, they work with Mana Cafe to provide fundraising opportunities with the bowls. And then also with the professor, uh, Dr. Or Ken Shipley's uh, 10,000 bowl program. So these students are working creating uh, lots and lots of bowls and perfecting the technique of making the same bowls over and over um, to perfection. And they're creating fundraising opportunities for local nonprofits uh, to raise money, um, mainly focusing on food insecurity, hunger and homelessness issues within our community. And so that is a picture of one of our students uh, working in that service learning class. Uh, another one of our service learning classes is our general ecology class. Um, this has got a lot of science to it, so I am not a scientist, so I will try and explain a little bit um, of what they were doing, but the students uh, during uh, the State Arbor Day, uh, took soil samples and tree samples and uh, determined the CO2, gallons of rainfall, air pollution, and how much uh, money uh, an in this individual tree um, gives back to the community, uh, or actually Austin P in terms of uh, financial benefit of having a tree. Because uh, most people see trees and don't think about uh, how beneficial they are. And so um, they did about 30 trees in the middle of campus uh, to educate the community uh, with these tree tags that they did. And so this is a program that they are able to bring to um, to schools, to um, community, um, uh, agencies, uh, education pieces to talk about the importance of having trees and landscaping to uh, improve our environment. So that's a general ecology project that they have done. And then uh, American history. Uh, so history is an area that maybe is not always um, 
as hands-on as some uh, other academic areas. And so Dr. Kelly Jones in our history department has found a way to make history kind of come alive through service learning. Our students in history have been working with uh, an old church in Coopertown, Tennessee, so just down the road, and they are trying to get this church put as a historic uh, location, um, and the paperwork to get that uh, designation put through is very lengthy and requires a lot of historical research. And so our students, as you can see, are going through uh, the census, uh, transcriptions uh, from uh, the church's documents, and they are working towards uh, getting that building uh, designated. And as, while it's designated, it can be um, protected and they can apply for grants uh, to uh, keep that structure um, upright and moving forward. So they have been working on this project for about two years now, and they hope to uh, come to fruition uh, in the next year. So several, several students. Um, I think she has four sections that are service learning this semester, which is very intense. Um, and that's a lot of students working on this project. So we're very proud of the work that service learning students um, have, been, have been able to do. All right, so uh, next I'm gonna highlight our alternative break program. This is the most popular program for students that we offer. I can't imagine why. So every time that classes are not in session, so fall break, winter break, spring break, summer break, uh, we take uh, groups of students on trips, both in-state and out-of-state, and they will volunteer between four to 10 days uh, in a different community from their own, learning about the community issues, um, getting to do a little bit of sightseeing and learning about um, the culture of where they are um, and having a lot of fun and working hard. So uh, we have uh, taken students uh, anywhere from Nashville to Guatemala as part of this program. We've been doing it for many years. Uh, on average, about 85 students go on these trips a year. Um, and the trips are only about 10 students um, that go uh, because 10 students can do a lot of work um, in a short amount of time. Uh, these trips are planned by uh, student leaders on campus uh, and they are uh, always uh, traveling with a faculty or staff chaperone who mainly drive the vehicle and make sure we don't spend too much money on the trips. So um, I actually brought Cassie here and she's gonna talk to you a little bit about her experience with alternative break. Um, so there you go, Cassie. Thank you. Um, as she said, my name's Cassie, and um, I want you to imagine for a moment getting into a van with complete strangers and then traveling to New Orleans, Louisiana. That's how I began my first alternative break trip experience. And while it was pretty intimidating, I loved every minute. I think it kicked in. <laughs> um, so we went to New Orleans, Louisiana, as I said, and we worked with three organizations while we were down there. Um, the Rescue Mission and then the Audubon Nature Institute which I had no idea what it was, but it was a really cool experience. And we also worked with um, something I also was not familiar with called the Villa Lobos Rescue Center. And so if you've heard of Pitbulls and Parolees, the TV show, this is where their dogs are. And so we got to walk these animals and I actually walked Ada and Molasses who really didn't care about anything I did except if they could bark at some cats. Mm -hmm. But. Um, overall, this experience, it was amazing. Um, I saw a lot of things I had never seen before, and I would definitely recommend it to any and everyone. So for the Audubon Institute, we worked with several different facilities of theirs. We worked with the zoo, the aquarium, the nature center, and <laughs> the nature center, we actually trekked through um, this flooded land where they planted a lot of trees, and they put these little white tags on them to like mark the tree but it actually got bleached by the sun. So now we had to go through and take all of those off so it wouldn't choke the tree out. And so during that, we got super muddy, but it was a really awesome way to serve this community in a way that I never thought we could. And then by far my favorite was the rescue mission. We worked um, and we served a meal twice. I would love to have done it every night, but I was not the trip leader, but, <laughs> and so, um, so we served this meal and we served over 100 people um, in New Orleans, and that was just really mind-blowing to me. I realized before this trip that hunger and homelessness is a real thing, and it affects our society. But like after the trip, I realized just how widespread it was. And so that trip actually inspired me to lead my own trip this fall. 
Um, I'm actually going to Louisville to serve with their rescue mission up in Kentucky. Um, we'll be working with their thrift store, which is a really cool um, initiative they've started to give their residents like job experience and to just help them get back on their feet. And so that's a really cool way. But while I love serving, I absolutely adore it. But I love the people I serve. And as a social work major, that's directly what I'm doing, is serving the people. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to go to Louisville. And I'm super excited to learn the stories of my group. And one of the really awesome things about Turner Break Trips is they bring people from all different walks of life together. When on my trip um, that I went on this past winter, there was a married couple, non-traditional students, freshmen, juniors, um, the vice president for student affairs. <laughs> yep, she was our van driver. She was awesome. And then we had our vista. <laughs> and we were all from different walks of life just serving this one people. And in those moments, we were just people loving on people. So that was the best experience for me. Thank you. With our alternative break program, we, we try to mix it up. So uh, several times we'll go back to the same agency and work on the same project. So uh, we've actually been going uh, to uh, Georgia and working with their state park system uh, for three years now. Um, we were actually supposed to go this fall, but we got a call um, after Hurricane Irma. They are uh, not quite prepared to have volunteers yet um, with some of their parks that we were going to work with. Um, um, and also uh, with our, uh, our partners in Antigua, Guatemala, we've been going for three years now um, working with uh, the rehabilitation of their um, fire stations in Guatemala. Never be in a fire in Guatemala. It's not a safe thing. Um, so we are working with them. Uh, they are not fully funded, their fire department there, so they rely mainly on volunteers to help with their uh, maintenance of their vehicles and their structures. Um, so we have been working with that program there. Um, moving on, one of our um, recently enhanced programs uh, I'd love to share with you um, is our Engage program. Um, recently this year we worked uh, in conjunction with our study abroad office um, and our quality enhancement uh, group to uh, secure funding to make it a global uh, focus on our ENGAGE program. So this is a living and learning community for students, meaning that they live together in the residence hall and they take classes together. So our group of 13 students that we have, um, getting them all together for one picture seemed impossible on our trip to Missouri, so there's about half of the group. Um, we, uh, they take four courses together over the course of this upcoming year. Uh, three of those classes are service learning classes, um, and one of the classes has a service learning and study abroad component as well. So as freshmen, uh, they will have uh, been immersed in high impact practices um, throughout their first year, so we're really hoping that uh, that experience for them um, will be very uh, powerful. And we're curious to see how it affects their next three years in college as well. So they live together, they take classes together, they have mandatory study hall together, and they have family dinners on Monday nights as well. Um, as a group, we focus on the United Nations global goals um, and active citizenship. So we are hoping that um, through this intense uh, experience together, we will have produced at least 13 uh, students who are very socially active uh, with our community needs and are uh, well-traveled uh, and have had some great experiences seeing how their skills and passions that they have can uh, make lifelong uh, changes in communities. So that is our Global Engage program. And then uh, the food pantry, uh, which is very near and dear to my heart and has given me many gray hairs in my life. Um, so the food pantry, which uh, Cheryl gave a great introduction to, um, has grown significantly in the past six years. I look back and I'm not quite sure how we got here. Um, it's because I don't know the word no. Um, so we have started off in a small um, school supply closet uh, in our office in student life. And uh, based on students stepping up and saying, this is something that I've seen a need, we have grown into a entire floor of a food pantry with a deep freezer, uh, which is full of uh, f uh, fresh, uh, grown in the backyard vegetables, um, 
uh, meats and uh, bread that's been donated. We have a refrigerator full of fresh vegetables. Um, we have a free thrift store, uh, which is full of clothing that is all at least business casual, um, and suits that are all donated from faculty, staff, and students. So students get a job interview or they get uh, a job and they haven't been gotten their first paycheck yet, they can come in and get a nice outfit um, so that they can represent themselves to the best of their ability. We have toiletry stand in there full of uh, shampoos, toothbrushes, toothpaste, um, all kinds of hygiene products. Um, we have uh, used school supplies, so maybe a student uses only half of their um, notebook for the semester. They can donate the rest of it in there, um, and we can have students that come in and grab that stuff. We have books in there. We have children's clothes, some children's toys. We have a lot of students that have, have kids, and so they'll come in, um, and their students will sometimes, the kids will like switch out toys. It's really adorable. Um, so we have uh, a wide variety of resources for students trying to meet their needs as students are going through a tough time. Uh, we don't ask for any proof of need. If a student comes in with an Austin PID, uh, we don't ask any questions. Uh, we say, how can we help you? Let's try and uh, meet whatever struggle you're going through. Um, on average, we have about 12 to 15 families that come through to use the food pantry. We feed everybody in that family. There's no point in just feeding a student if they go home and then share all of the food with the people that are living with them. So we take care of the whole uh, family unit. We know a lot of our students have children or they're living with uh, family members that they're helping support, so we wanna make sure that we're helping everybody that we can. Um, but one of our focuses uh, is that we are providing healthy options for our students. So we don't see the point in feeding students canned beans and ramen um, because we want them to live strong, full, healthy lives, and uh, that's not going to cut it. So uh, through student suggestions and students really pushing forward, we have 26 garden beds on campus that uh, we have uh, going year-round, uh, vegetables and fruit growing in. We have 12 fruit trees, we call it our mini orchard, um, that we are fighting the deer with constantly. Um, we uh, also have 12 chickens, uh, which are responsible for my gray hair, and uh, they are actually uh, behind our building, um, and they provide a fresh source of protein eggs, not the chickens themselves. <laughs> we will never, ever eat one of our chickens. Um, they're like mini celebrities on campus. Uh, and to fund uh, the chickens, uh, we came up with a uh, funding source of kind of adopt a chicken. So people adopt these chickens uh, for $50 a year. They get to name it, um, they get uh, like semesterly photos of their chicken. Uh, they can come visit it at any time. Um, and so that's how we're able to keep that program going. Every couple years I have about 10 baby chicks in my office that are you know, growing so they, they can go outside. So it's, it's a fun activity. The students love the chickens. Uh, no, they will never be in a homecoming parade. Um, I'm scared of PETA. So uh, the chickens uh, provide a great, great source of entertainment um, and a valuable uh, source of fresh protein for our students. So we have fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, and fresh protein, and we work very closely with the community. They're very supportive. Uh, we work with uh, Lowe's and Fishes, which is just across the street, um, with some of their fresh donations they receive. The downtown's farmer's market lets us come down um, every other Saturday, and we can, uh, farmers donate whatever is left over that hasn't been sold um, from the farmer's market. And then we work with the Lions Club as well to get donations. So um, we have not ever had to go out and buy food uh, for our food pantry to keep it stocked. We are very, very supported by the students, faculty, and staff, and then community partners, um, which I think says a lot. We were the first food pantry on a college campus in the state of Tennessee, and we have helped open uh, food pantries all across the country, but also now most major universities in Tennessee have food pantries based off of ours. Um, we've had visits from schools in Kentucky, South Carolina, and Georgia actually come here and tour our facilities and learn about how we've gotten to where we have gotten. Um, to continue with the uh, spirit of the food pantry and our uh, office's personal dedication towards sustainability, we have uh, worked to add a uh, 
very large composter um, to uh, provide fresh compost uh, to work with our gardens since we have 26 of them, so that's quite a lot of uh, garden beds to keep upright. So uh, we're working with our dining services on campus. We go daily, every day, rain or shine, and we collect the food waste from the cafeteria. We bring it over to the composter, um, and the composter holds like 200 pounds of food. It's very large. Um, and so that's something that the university has helped support um, with us, uh, the composting effort as well. So we're kind of an office of, of agils of all trade, um, compost, chickens, traveling, faculty members, um, you name it. So um, it's never a dull day working with our program. Great job. Thanks. Uh, I'd like now to report on actions of the executive committee, which met on June 21st uh, this summer and yesterday, September 14th. At the June 21st, 2017 executive committee meeting, the executive committee discussed President White's incentive payment plan for 2016-17, which was based upon meeting benchmarks established by the Chancellor of TBR. At the conclusion of the discussion, the Executive Committee voted to approve a $15,233 incentive payment for 2016-17. Mitch Robinson explained the current plan for the President's base compensation, incentive, and performance evaluation. We discuss compensation for presidents of other universities in the state and region and inquire as to where Austin P. State University's president's salary falls within that range. It was determined that it falls very near the bottom. So I asked Trustee Atkins to work with Vice President Robinson to develop an evaluation and compensation matrix. During our executive committee meeting yesterday, Trustee Atkins presented a draft version of the President's Evaluation and Compensation Plan. After a robust discussion, the committee is submitting to you a plan for your approval today. We also were provided an update on the University's Affirmative Action Plan by Sheila Bryant, Director of Equal Opportunity and Affirmative Action. At this time, I move for adoption of the June 21, 2017 and September 14, 2017 Executive Committee minutes. Is there a second? Second. Second by Trustee Kanata. It has been moved and seconded that we adopt the June 21st, 2017 and September 14, 2017 minutes of the Executive Committee meetings. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of adopting the minutes of the Executive Committee meetings signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Minutes are approved. Um, my report contained an action item that we need to consider as a full board. I move that we adopt the 2017-18 Presidential Evaluation and Compensation Plan. And, and Dr. White obviously is stepping out for, for this portion of the meeting. Okay. And the President's salary this year should be 10% increase in addition to the 2% across the board, which would amount then to $293,200. Because the plan was approved by the Executive Committee, the motion does not require a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, the question is on the motion of approving and adopting the 2017-18 Presidential Evaluation and Compensation Plan. All in favor of adopting the Presidential Evaluation and Compensation Plan for 2017-18 signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. I'd like now to recognize Trustee Jenkins, Chair of the Academic Policies and Programs Student Life Committees to give us a report on the committee meeting yesterday. Thanks. I didn't know Thanks for the opportunity to present our report from the University's Academic Programs and Policy Student Life Board Committee meeting. The committee reviewed three information items. Provost Gandhi provided an update on the proposed Doctor of Educational Leadership. He explained the letter of notification to develop a Master of Fine Arts in Studio Arts degree program. 
Also, he discussed low-producing programs. He explained a report that showed the number of graduates for each major and the five-year rolling average for each. We also learned that two Austin P. majors are below the Tennessee Higher Education benchmark for the expected average of the number of graduates. One program, the B.S. in Professional Studies, has been terminated. The other program, a B.S. and a B.A., Philosophy and Religion, developed a plan to increase the number of graduates. The committee reviewed and approved the following action items, which you approved today by consent. Proposed a B.S. Aviation Science with concentration in rotor wing. Tenure upon appointment, Dr. Scott Culhane, Chair, Department of Criminal Justice. The committee reviewed and voted to deny the following action item. Request by Dr. Robert Halliman to appeal a promotion decision. The above item will be presented for your review and action after the approval of the board committee minutes. That concludes my report, and I move that the board approve the minutes of the September 14th Academic Programs and Policy Student Life Board Committee as written. Second. Second. Uh, seconded by General Mueller. Uh, it has been moved and seconded that we adopt the minutes of the Academic Policies and Programs Student Life Committee. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of adopting the minutes of the Academic Policies and Programs Student Life Committee signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Minutes are approved. Thank you, Don. Trustee Jenkins' report contained action items that we need to consider as a full board. Trustee Jenkins, do you have a motion for us? have before you the information regarding a request by Dr. Robert Halliman to appeal the promotion decision. By direction of the committee, I move to deny Dr. Halliman's request to appeal the promotion decision. Because it is a motion of the committee, we do not need a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, the question on the promotion appeal of Dr. Robert Halliman, uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, would you note an, an abstention, please? Uh, my uh, husband is currently Dr. Hellman's department chair, so I'm abstaining from this vote. So doc, Dr. Rayburn has abstained from the vote, and please carry that or show that, reflect that in the minutes. Thank you. I'd like now to rec recognize Trustee Kanata, Chair of the Audit Committee, to give us a report of the committee meeting yesterday. Thank you. Yesterday we had two action items and several informational items. The two action items were that we approved the salaries and budget related to the Internal Audit Office. We also approved the 2018 Internal Audit Plan. Blaine Clements went over several informational items. The Office of Internal Audit's year-end report. We reviewed the internal audit reports issued between May and August 2017, along with a list of outstanding audit recommendations. We reviewed the periodic quality assessment methodologies. We reviewed the methodology for university risk assessment process. We also reviewed the University Code of Conduct policy. We also reviewed the University Conflict of Interest policy. So I'd like to call a motion to approve the minutes from yesterday's audit committee meeting held September 14th. So moved. Is there a second? Seconded by Trustee Jenkins that we adopt the minutes of the Audit Committee. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of adopting the minutes of the Audit Committee, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Minutes are approved. Trustee Kanata, are there any other items for the full board to consider? Not today. Thank you very much, Catherine. I'd now like to recognize Trustee Atkins. Chair of the Business and Finance Committee to give us a report on their committee meeting yesterday. Thank you, Chairman O'Malley. Uh, the report for the Business and Finance Committee meeting 
thanks for the opportunity to present my report from yesterday's meetings. The committee reviewed and approved the following action items. A, capital outlay and maintenance. Request for fiscal year 2018 through 2019. The list of capital outlay, maintenance, and disclosed project requests were reviewed and approved. The university proposed a new health care professions building. Two maintenance projects, which include upgrades to the HVAC and fire alarm systems in several buildings, and one disclosed project for fiscal year 2018 and 19. B, policy on access to and use of campus property and facilities, which is policy 1.019. The policy on access to and use of campus property and facilities sets up the policy and procedures for the use of campus property and facilities. The policy has been updated to be in compliance with the Campus Free Speech Protection Act, which takes effect January the 1st, 2018. Item C, fees, charges, refunds, and fee adjustments policies, number 1.021. Details the fees that the university has and the approval process. All fees approved by the Board of Trustees unless the board has delegated the approval to the president. The policy is being updated to remove procedural and accounting items that will be placed in departmental guidelines. And D, Campus Facility Master Plan. The Campus Facility Master Plan Policy 1.026 dictates the use of the master plan and how often the master plan should be reviewed by the campus. The Campus Facility Master Plan will be approved by the Board of Trustees at the winter meeting, and the policy sets the requirements for the master plan from Tennessee Higher Education Commission. And E, campus property acquisitions. This item will be presented for your review and action in a few minutes. That, in, that concludes my report, and I move that the board approve the minutes of the September 14th Business and Finance Committee as written. Second. 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 Aye. Uh, Trustee Atkins' report contained action items that we need to consider as a full board. Trustee Atkins, do you have a motion for us? I'm sorry. Repeat that was read. Oh, sorry. I have a, a motion for us with respect to actions that were taken in the meeting yesterday. Yes, for the trustees, you have um, before you the information for the campus property acquisitions by the direction of the committee, I move to approve the, approve the campus property acquisitions. Do you heard the motion on campus property acquisitions? Is there any discussion? Hearing none, the question on the motion of the uh, campus property acquisitions, <coughs> we need a voice vote. Okay, so we'll need a, vo a roll call vote for that. Trustee Atkins. Yes. Trustee Kanata. Yes. Trustee Carroll. Yes. Trustee Jenkins. Yes. Trustee Luck. Trustee May. Yes. Trustee Mueller. Yes. Trustee O'Malley. Yes. Trustee Rayburn. Yes. Eight yeses. It's correct. The approval of the policy on access to campus, access to and use of campus property and facilities, and also the approval of fees, charges, refunds, and fee adjustments. This is uh, items uh, three D little three I one and two. And if you'd like, you can make a motion to approve both of those together, and we can take a roll call vote. use of uh, 
campus property and facilities. The policy has been updated to be in accordance with the Campus Free Speech Protection Act, which takes effect at January the 1st, 2018. So, so you hear the motion on the policy on access to and use of campus property and facilities. I hear a second. Any discussion? Question on approval of policy on access to and use of campus property and facilities. Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Atkins. Aye. Trustee Canada. Yes. Trustee Carroll. Yes. Trustee Jenkins. Yes. Trustee Luck. Trustee May. Yes. Trustee Mueller. Yes. Trustee O'Malley. Yes. Trustee Rayburn. Yes. Eight yeses. Thank you. Next subject is approval of fees, charges, refunds, and fee adjustment policy 1.021. Fees, charges, refunds, and fee adjustments policy 1.021 details the required fees of the university and the process for approving them. All fees are approved by the Board of Trustees unless the Board has delegated the approval to the President. The policy is being updated to remove procedural and accounting items that will be placed in departmental guidelines. So you've heard the motion. Are you making a motion to that effect? Yes. Thank you. So you've heard the motion on the approval of fees, charges, refunds, and fee adjustments policy. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, the question on the approval of fees, charges, refunds, and fee adjustments policy. Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Atkins. Yes. Trustee Canada. Yes. Trustee Carroll. Yes. Trustee Jenkins. Yes. Trustee May. Yes. Trustee Mueller. Yes. Trustee O'Malley. Yes. Trustee Rayburn. Yes. Eight yeses. Okay. The next item that we had in committee, the Business and Finance Committee is responsible for recommending the approval of the lease, purchase, and disposal of real estate to the full Board of Trustees. Austin P. acquires property that is within close proximity of campus and that it is a part of the campus facility master plan. Proposed implementation date is the fall of 2017, and I recommend approval. Okay. SAC, is that how you pronounce SAC -C -C. it? SAC-COC. SAC-COC, sorry. Standard 3.1.1 requires the institution's governing board to approve the institution's mission statement. Since we are a new board, we need to affirm the mission statement of Austin P. State University. The full mission statement is found in your printed materials. I move that we affirm the mission statement of Austin P. State University. Is there a second? Seconded by... Uh, Trustee Carroll, it is moved and seconded that we affirm APSU's mission, mission statement. Any discussion? Hearing none, the question is on affirming Austin P's mission statement. All favor, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Now need to set the calendar of meeting dates for 2018. As a reminder, the FOCUS Act requires the board to have four regularly scheduled meetings per year. The following dates are presented after polling trustees about their availability and reviewing the campus calendar. Proposed 2018 meeting dates are as follows. Sp the spring meeting, March 8 and 9. The summer meeting, June 7 and 8. Fall meeting, September 13 and 14. And the winter meeting, November 29 and 30. I move that we accept the proposed meeting calendar for 2018. Do I hear a second? Second. Seconded that we approve the 2018 meeting calendar as presented. Any discussion? I was wondering if there's any room or flexibility to adjust the spring uh, schedule. The March 8th and 9th dates fall um, during spring break. So I was wondering if there was any flexibility in changing that. <laughs> uh, I'm sure there is. Uh, we may have to relook at it, but if, if not, I guess then we'll get back to you. I'll ask another panel. Well, Comment? 
Yes, we there were dates that we that we floated around, and so we have to have a quorum. This date was the only date for March that we could secure a quorum. So, um, I think the flexibility there is really not there to, based on everyone's schedule. Okay. Thank you. So, is there any all in favor then of? approving or adopting the 2018 meeting calendar signify by saying aye. Aye. At this time, I'd like to recognize President White to give her report and also to report on any interim items. Thank you, Chairman O'Malley. Um, just a quick update on some of the communication strategies that we're employing to improve our communication on campus. Marketing and public relations just showing how Austin P has been mentioned in the news. And so they do a, a regular digest of print and broadcast news pieces. And, and we don't filter those. We just send you what's out there so that you know how those are, are treated in the media. Uh, in a few minutes, you're going to get an update on our progress toward uh, the new master plan. And frankly, there's very little that we will ever do that has more impact on the university than getting that master plan right. The process gives us some time to flex and take advantage of opportunities as we go forward. It is a plan that will change over time, but with the acquisition of the College Street property just a little while ago, it gives us an op it really gives us a chance to do something transformative and a chance that has not been here in a long time and a chance that may never come again to have the kind of impact uh, that these next decisions will make on not only our campus but downtown. So as you listen to the presentation of data, keep in mind that the university has several goals. Number one is educating our students. That has to be paramount. We have to have good teaching and learning space and you'll hear that we are just about out of space. And frankly, I want more than adequate space. We need to have excellent space. We need to have state-of-the-art space, especially in some of the disciplines where uh, students are re-graduating to work in areas that are highly competitive and highly technical. We also should create and maintain the right env environment for our faculty and our staff so that they can serve our students properly and do excellent work. We really have a wonderful faculty and staff and we wanna do everything we can to retain them. In addition, Austin P is a steward of place. We are residents, we are collaborators, we are neighbors with the city of Clarksville, Clarksville, Montgomery County, and Middle Tennessee. We're important uh, in terms of e being an economic driver to our communities, and we are, we are an institution of influence in the region. So what does that mean? It means that we wanna develop the property so that it supports the university community, and it is a catalyst for the development of our neighborhood, and our neighborhood happens to be downtown Clarksville. We must build our neighborhood to support activities and living spaces for our increasing numbers of students and employees. Our master plan must align with our strategic plan, and you will see that in a few minutes. You all have copies of the strategic plan. Some of you attended Tuesday's ribbon cutting and dedication of our new Art Plus design building, which you all toured just a few months ago. You know, I was so gratified this week by that ribbon cutting because the weather was terrible. It was a little cold, actually. It was rainy. It was wet. We had to move everything indoors, and we had more than 200 people show up for that event, and it was really phenomenal. And so it, it just shows the kind of support that we have in the community. And, and our students, I mean, I thought the faculty were thrilled, but the students are so excited about getting to learn and work in that space. And that's really why we're all here. Tuesday also was a special day for the Department of Theater and Dance. We had a ribbon cutting for the renovated space that is now the Margaret Fort Traherne Laboratory Theater. Our students will put on a musical theater performance, Stephen Sondheim's company in October, and I hope you can see it. They gave us a, a sneak preview uh, Tuesday and the Traherns were just thrilled about it. So, you know, everything hinges on university enrollment. That is critical to our success going forward, and our university is growing, and it will continue to grow. And that brings great angst to a lot of people uh, who are internal stakeholders as well as external. 
But I want to tell you why it's important that we grow and also let you know that we're not growing just to grow. Thomas Aquinas said, if the highest aim of a captain were to preserve his ship, he would keep it in port forever. We're not going to keep Austin P in port. For one, ships that stay in port forever don't survive. They don't stay the same. We have the privilege and the opportunity to continue to do great things and to be a transformative agent in this area in the lives of our students and their families, and Austin P is up to the challenge. So how are we going to grow? And why, again? Well, number one, we're going to grow our graduate school. According to Deborah Stewart, the former president of the Council of Graduate Schools, jobs that require a master's degree are expected to grow nearly 22% in the next five years. That's faster than the growth at any other education level. Gains will be largest in computer science, math, public administration, engineering, and health sciences. Other fast-growing occupations, such as school counseling, nurse <coughs> practitioners, marriage and family therapists, also require master's degrees. We're making progress in our quest to offer doctoral programs. You heard some of that yesterday in your committee meetings. But we're not just focusing on doctoral programs to get doctoral programs. We are focusing on doctoral programs that meet a particular need in our area. The first one will be in education, and I'm very happy to be located in a community with an excellent public school system. Our residents here have options, really great options for both public and private school education for their children, and all of these schools need teachers and administrators. Our school system is growing at an incredible rate. I heard this week that Clarksville Montgomery County system has 1,400 new schools. I'm not school, that would be amazing. <laughs> students, <laughs> students. 1,400 new students. They have to have people to teach them. They have, have to have spaces to teach them in. They have to have administrators and people at uh, all the schools and all, also at the district to take care of those students. They had more than 1,000 new students last year. So this is not slowing, which means there's going to be more of a requirement and a need for students with advanced degrees in education. We'll also seek another doctoral program in psychology with a focus on producing practitioners who can treat clients with PTSD. Again, looking at how we better serve our region. We are a military-friendly area of the state, actually of the country, and it's, we're finding that it's not only people who were in battle who suffer from PTSD, but their families have been through uh, great harm in some cases, and we feel that it's our obligation and our privilege to serve them. We want to grow our international enrollment as well. We live in a global society. Many of you on the board are, are business people, and you work in a global economy. Our students need a cultural awareness, and they need a knowledge of history, political, and economic systems of other countries in order to be prepared to live in a global society and to join a workforce that is tied to the global economy or to serve a diverse marketplace. It's one thing to read about other cultures. It's another thing to visit other places. It's entirely different to have very close bonds and friendships and relationships with people who are unlike ourselves. And we want to provide that opportunity for our students. Many of our resident students don't have the opportunity to travel outside the United States. And recruiting international students here will give them an opportunity and broaden their educational experience in ways that will serve them throughout their lives. We want to grow our presence at Fort Campbell so that we can better serve our military students and their families. We've grown our freshman class considerably the last couple of years, and we're serving more students across the state than ever before. We are getting increasing numbers of students from outside this five-county region. We're getting more students from the Memphis area, from the Chattanooga area. Austin P has become an institution that's a destination for many prospective students in Tennessee. And so we want them to come here. That's good economically for us because students who come to school here often stay here. They contribute to the economy. We had a 32% increase from 2011 to 2016 in our first time freshmen under the age of 21. 32%, that's an incredible number. Now, what does that mean? I sit in my office in Browning. I have the same space I had. I have the same computer. I have the same number of hours in the day. But our faculty are teaching more. They're teaching more freshmen. It's a very different thing to teach freshmen than it is to teach juniors and seniors. And so we're putting a strain on our resources by doing what we know that we should do 
but it doesn't mean that we're doing it without some pains. So it's also put a strain on not only our classrooms, but our campus housing. We were not able to accommodate as many non-freshman students this year. Freshmen really need to stay on campus. But frankly, retention and student success is better if upperclassmen also stay on campus. Many of them don't want to, but many of them do. We had transfer students this year who wanted to come and live on campus because they were denied that experience uh, as they went to community college. We didn't have room for them. We put the freshmen in the student housing first. So we were, not offering, we were not able to offer housing to them. So we're looking at ways to increase housing options for our students. We had some students in hotels the first couple of weeks of the semester, but all have been accommodated since then. Frankly, our biggest challenge is financial. We got the significant state funding, and I'm so grateful to have significant state funding to help us put up that arts and design building. The university had been waiting, as that, uh, that was our number one project for 13 years. <coughs> Faculty who were involved in programming that building started it 25 years ago. They had waited a long time for that building, and we needed it. But the time that it made it up to the state list was also the time that we were able to buy this property and the property across the street, which put some strain on our, our uh, financial ability to flex because we did not get any state funding for those properties. So we put in a $6.5 million match on the Arts and Design Building at the same time that we put several million dollars on the property uh, located next to campus. So we're not really in a position for borrowing money for student housing. So we're looking at a potential public-private partnership. We're talking to people who might be interested in uh, bidding if, if we wanted them to put some sort of student housing with retail options next door. There may be opportunities for us to do a ground lease. There may be opportunities for us to uh, lease something uh, to lease property that's built by someone else. So we're not really sure exactly the way to go until we look at the performa and the financials. But in the meantime, we're preparing a case for new housing that we'll share with you and we'll share with the State Building Commission because that case will be needed whether we build, whether we enter into a public-private partnership with uh, someone else who will build on our land, or whether we lease uh, someone else's property. We still have to have the case statement. As we grow, though, it's also important to preserve what makes Austin Peay special. And many of you agreed to serve on this board because you know it's special. You were students here, you worked here, you were transformed here, your family members went here, you have a relationship with faculty here, and so I don't have to, I don't have to sell you on the story of how special it is. But Austin Peay has a culture of facilitating student success. If our students don't do well, there's no reason for us to be here. We understand the value of education. We understand the opportunities that we have to help students get that education. And frankly, we provide opportunities to some students who wouldn't have opportunities elsewhere. We have a culture of honoring and serving our military. That is a privilege to us. We have a culture of providing access to populations that have been traditionally underrepresented in higher education. We have a culture of supporting our community, whether through economic development, the arts, or K through 12 educational system. We have a culture of shared governance that supports strong and positive relationships among faculty, staff, and administration. Doesn't mean that we always agree. It doesn't mean we always get along. But what it does mean is that we understand and recognize we have a significant amount of intellectual capital on this campus and that we need to draw on that before making decisions. We're stronger when we draw from it. So how we grow will inform our strategies on space, particularly as it relates to housing and dining services. So you've seen our strategic plan leading through excellence many times. And today in your packets, you'll see a flyer demonstrating some progress in each goal area. And the reason we're putting this, this uh, flyer together is to demonstrate that our strategic plan is a living document and it's one that guides our thinking, it guides our action, it guides our resources. It, what you read is not all the progress that we've made. We just selectively highlighted some areas to show you. And we have meetings regularly on action plans and progress. How are we going in this goal? Is this working in the right way? And I'll, I'll just uh, disclose one of the areas that I've been really surprised. So when I looked at international student uh, and, and, and how many international students we had on campus, when I looked at our graduate school and how many graduate students we had on campus, this was in 2014. 
we were not uh, what I would say right sized. I'm not saying that we were wrong sized. We just had fewer international students than you would expect for a campus our size. So for instance, for a campus of about 10,000 students, you would see typically 600 to 1,000 graduate students. In 2014, we had, uh, we had 47. Uh, the next uh, public school in public university in Tennessee that had the next fewest was UT Martin, and at that time they had 300. So we just were not even on the radar. Our graduate school is also smaller than you would expect for a university our size, especially given our market. And I think what happened is we were growing so fast at the undergraduate level, all of our resources were going to support those students who came in. But strategically going forward, when you think about what you get from a graduate school, you would expect out of 10,000 students to have 1,500 to 2,500 of them at the graduate level. We had about 850 in 2014. And so in my infinite wisdom, I said, we're going to grow in these areas. And what I've determined is we didn't grow in those areas. We grew in freshmen, which was stunning because our sister institutions in Tennessee were losing freshmen. So we didn't grow where I thought we would grow, and we grew in areas that I didn't think we would grow. So I just give you that as an example. We're tracking that growth. We're tracking how we're progressing on those initiatives. Now, I haven't changed or amended the goal for international and graduate because I believe in it. I know it's the right thing to do. But we had some personnel changes and some vacant positions and some interims that put us behind in recruiting where I thought we would actually have an easier place to recruit. We're still going in that direction, and we've had some traction in both of those areas this year. The fact that we had the freshman students, though, was surprising, because what I, what I expected is if you right-size the graduate school, if you right-size the international population, and then you get back the students that we lost from 2011 to 2015, we would be just about 13,000 students. That's where the 13,000 comes. It wasn't just saying, let's grow to 13,000 students. It's, okay, let's look at our campus and see who's missing. And when you pull those people back in, you're at 13,000. And because I know that we can do a great job of telling the story of Austin P, I I know that incrementally we will grow from 13 to 15,000. So where we are now is we, are, we have really kind of done it backwards. I thought we would do the graduate, the international, then we would find those students that we lost in that four-year period. We got those students back. <laughs> we're, we're kind of where we were, and now we just have to grow the international and the graduate. So uh, don't tell Dr. Boggs I'm still expecting more freshmen coming in. But, mm-hmm. but still, it, my point is we have to track and look and revise and also understand that this is, this is a, a method for us to determine, are we on the right track? Do we need to revise what we're doing? Do we need to revise our goals? Is this still important to us? So our strategic plan will inform our master plan as well. So I just wanted you to know that we are working daily to improve the institution. It's a very special place, and we're trying to put in some infrastructure that will help it be sustainable in good times and tough times, because right now we're in a good time, but tough times always follow good times. There'll be times of of economic um, downturns in the state of Tennessee. Right now we're very well supported. We don't have enough money, but if you look at Austin P in the state of Tennessee versus other states in the United States, we we are among the most fortunate in the state, in the region, in the nation but we're trying to put it in infrastructure so that when those downturns come, we'll be prepared and we'll be very healthy. So we are uh, using the strategic plan to guide our thinking, our planning, the spending of our resources, and it's a plan for which we are accountable. And so if you have any questions about the strategic plan, I'm happy to, or, or actually any of my remarks, I'm happy to answer or hear your comments. We won't know until October because the Fort Campbell students are added in separately, uh, but it looks about 10, 6, 10, 5, 5. As of right now, we're at about uh, 10,200 plus a little. 
Typically, we add about 300 students from Fort Campbell, enrollment in October. And that's, let me say one more thing about this. So when we put this document together, we thought we'd be about 10-7. But some of that is because um, the university did not have a history of capturing data. So we're just now building predictive models. Uh, we started capturing data two years ago. August of 15. August of 15. So we have to have, we have, to have apples to compare with apples. And we're just now building that historical record so that our predictive modeling means something. So we're a little bit off, but next year we should be a little bit better. What you hear, what I hear is lots of challenges, but also lots of opportunities. And I'm sure it's no accident that you're... <laughs> master plan revision, which was last updated in 2013. We've engaged the services of campus planning firm Dober Lidsky Mathy, who completed the, th the 2013 master plan. Art Lidsky of the firm will provide us with an update of the planning process. I'm really pleased to be here. And I have 646 slides, so uh, <laughs> I, hope, I hope you don't mind. So this is really a status report. It, it is a way to help you understand where we are in the current thinking. Uh, it is going to change somewhat as we go through this, um, but it is one to bring you up to date. We um, first did a, let's see, we first did a, a master plan for this university in 2013. And the renovation of Treherne Tre and the new arts building was one uh, or two products that came out of that master plan. And uh, to do that, we had quite a number of meetings. We met with students, faculty, and staff. and did, We had a variety of different committees working with us and so on. Um, but four years later, uh, there's a new administration. More importantly, there is, in, in my mind, there's a strategic plan, which we didn't have before. So I, th I think it is really the essential sort of beginning point of reference as we think about the future of this institution and where it wants to go. Um, the vision statement, I think, is, is, a, is a good one. Uh, the mission statement you just approved is another uh, good one. And we're using this strategic plan as a way to help orchestrate the process that we're going through now. Um, we did a number of different mapping exercises where we looked at uh, various aspects of the campus from topography to landscape, from parking to the way people walk around and move through the campus uh, as important ways for us to understand the nature of this campus. Um, we also have done a number of different analyses to understand how much space you have and how, how you're using that space and is it appropriate for your use. So this is a peer comparison of the six institutions in the Tennessee system. Used to be part of the TBR system and now they're each independent. Um, we're looking at um, spaces across the, the, this chart. So for instance, looking at, at classrooms, the amount of space per student in Austin P is 10 square feet per student. The mean, which is the very last column on the right, is almost 16 square feet per student. The, 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 the um, numbers that are highlighted in this cream color are the lowest numbers in that column, or in that row. So you'll see, though, that in Austin P, basically there are three areas where you are on the low side in comparison to the mean. Classrooms, laboratories, research laboratories, and the library. You are probably you're the highest, I think, uh, in terms of the mean uh, at, at, in the athletic uh, physical education area. So bear in mind that this is looking at these particular aspects of a campus. We're looking at the amount of space per student, and I'm comparing it to the mean. Um, I don't know whether or not you want to be at the average. I'm assuming that as you try to become a better institution, you're going to push that number higher than, than the average. But this is sim just simply to say where you are. And right now, where you are is about 12 square feet per student lower than the average. 
12 square feet is a small number, except when you start to multiply it by the number of students. And when you do that, uh, it is a large number. And this is just um, net assignable square feet per student. And here's the, how that uh, calculation would show up. You'd actually need a nine, almost 100,000 square feet of space just to hit that mean average. You'll need a lot more than that uh, in the future when you grow your enrollment. Bear in mind that this is simply just taking numbers back and forth, and it's a meaningless number when you start to think really carefully about how much space you'll need in the future and as you explore that. We also, um, oh, I want to talk a little bit about student enrollment. Um, we've been using the existing number, of, you know, in 2016, you had 10,344 students on this campus, uh, which works out to be 8,000 full-time equivalent students. But not all students generate space. There are some students that are at, at the fort, there are some students that are online, and when you remove those students, you come down to what we are calling on-ground students. These are the students that are actually going to have an impact on the amount of space that you need, that you have today and what you'll need in the future. And so you can see the, the difference from when there's 15,000 enrollment, you'll be at, a headcount, once you remove the, the students who are, are not physically here, you'll be really about 12,000 students, and you'll have an FTE enrollment of almost 9,000 students. Again, these are the students that will be generating space. And I'm using the term FTE, and I'm assuming you all know what that means. Full-time equivalent students? Any questions about that? You're okay with that? Okay. Um, we looked at how you're using your classrooms and your laboratories and your studios. Um, in the fall of 2016, you had 89 classrooms. They were used on average 27 hours per week. And the state, and most states that have standards, say that a typical classroom should be used 30 hours per week. If you're looking at a scheduling window from 8 to 5 or from 9 to, to 6, they want your, to, you to use your classrooms 30 hours per week on average, and you're 27 hours per week. This has nothing to do with whether those rooms are appropriate, whether they're the right size, whether they're the right condition. This is simply saying you have 89 rooms and they're used 27 hours per week. You also had um, 75 laboratories and studios that were used 19 hours per week, and again, the state standard is 20 hours per week. You're using, the standard is less for laboratories than for classrooms because of setup time and takedown time. You're using, uh, you have to clean those laboratories and you can leave things up and down and so on. So they don't expect you to use your laboratories to the same extent as you would for classrooms. Nevertheless, that's what you're, you're doing now. And in my mind, in looking at those numbers, you're at capacity. If you're, if you're gonna be adding more, more students to this uh, in, institution, you could be using more time and more classroom space and so on. And I'm not sure how you can do that. I know you can't really do that. You'll be over the standard in a significant way in classrooms and in laboratories as you grow your enrollment unless you add additional space for those activities. And again, it has nothing to do with whether the quality of those spaces are appropriate. And when I looked at the size of, of your classrooms, they are small in comparison to contemporary standards. It's active learning, which is a pedagogy that has become, I think, a very important um, way to, to teach students, requires more space per student than the typical lecture hall space that we have today. So I, th I think that not only will we need more space, more rooms to teach in, there need to be a different type of room and different size of room. So let's see. Um, that circle is a walking distance from the edge of the circle to the other edge of the circle of 10 minutes. That's five minutes from the center of it. 10 minutes is the time between classes. So you want all of your academic buildings to be within that circle. And in fact, they, they almost all are within that circle. Um, that's your academic core. Uh, and all your academic buildings are basically within that other than some academic space in the Dunn Center. Um, your residential area on campus, most of your, of your residential is in that circle. You have some up in Emerald Hill, you have some uh, in the center of the campus, but the majority of your students live in that circle. Uh, your student life, the student union, uh, dining and so on, are located in that circle. 
and athletics and recreation. That's an interesting sort of way to think about the campus in terms of as you zone the air, different areas. Um, that's, you know, that's College Street. And when you think about a possible P3 zone, what I'm showing you there is, in my mind, an excellent one. It's right on the edge of the campus. It's also right on the edge of the downtown and, and the commercial side of things. And it's a perfect location. There are two properties in there that you still need to get. I'm hoping you'll get them in the next year or two. The Wesleyan and Johnny's. And Johnny's you could always incorporate in the P3. So Explain P3 so um, they don't wonder what it is. Let me show you, I'll, I'll come to that, but I'll, I'll explain. Well, no, it, it's public private public, public private, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, yep. It is um, where you will have a marrying of some public uh, needs and some private needs, and you bring them together to develop something. Usually it's, it's for colleges and universities, it's housing, and sometimes they're mixed use for housing and retail and commercial. So um, this is a quick definition of, of public-private partnership, P3. Uh, why, why would an institution do it? Usually it's to do something uh, uh, when the state regulations makes it more difficult for you to do it. It's sometimes it's a way to keep the project off your budget because you can do it outside of the budget. Um, you can maintain your credit rating and so on. It is complex. Sometimes it requires a great deal of thinking and negotiation beforehand to come up with the, the financial statements that are, you're comfortable with. Um, it, it, I think, requires you to think about giving up land ownership for 40 to 65 years if, in fact, you were to go in that, 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 that uh, direction. There are some very successful ones to, to look at. There are some ones that are not so successful. The larger the university, usually the more successful they can be because they're bigger projects. Um, I, th I think you need to pick your partner carefully since it's a long-term commitment. But it's one that, that is becoming an interesting tool to move forward on different types of projects. Um, so I guess the question is you need to, to think carefully and I think that, that the university is beginning to think really carefully about why should we do this and how. Uh, and I also think that you need to bring in an advisor who is skilled in helping institutions go through this process because it is complex and requires a great deal of time that you might not have uh, in the people that are around the table. And I know that there is a committee that the university has set up to do actually to start that conversation. So this is a list of potential projects that have come out of all the discussions and the committee meetings and meetings that we've had with faculty, staff, and students. On the, the left-hand side are potential new projects, new construction projects. On the right-hand side are potential renovation projects. And in the middle are some combination of the two. And a building that I've been trying to get rid of for a long time, Marks Hall. Uh, it's still not going to happen in a while, but that's, I'd like to see that gone. So um, we. I, th I think the highest priority project that the university would like to move forward with is this professions, the uh, health professions building. It is the one that, that has gone, f or will be going forward to THEC, uh in October, I think it is. And we sat down and we worked out a facility program to, to decide how much space they would need as they think about their future. So there are one, two, three, four, five, five departments, six buildings, and they currently have about 35,000 net square feet of space. And as we sat with them and talked about what they would need in the future and their, their future programs and the number of students that they expect to have, we defined a need for about 67,000 square feet of space. This is net assignable square feet. So net assignable is um, what they would require, but, but a building actually has what's called gross square feet. So when you add in the circulation, the hallways, the stairwells, the elevators, the mechanical systems, the structure, and so on, the net assignable is 60% of that total. So the actual total, a building that you're going to build is 113,000 square feet, gross square feet of space. So what's it going to cost? So at this point where you could estimate, based upon just on the size of it, we think that, that a good number to use for planning purposes is $425 a gross square feet of space. Um, that means that the building for construction cost would be about $48 million. 
that's how much you would give the contractor to build the building, but there are other costs involved, architects and engineers' fees, furniture and equipment, contingency, landscape costs, and so on. And usually those are what's called soft costs, and we use a 1.3 multiplier, 1.35 multiplier, which is a typical for this type of building. So in reality, the, the health profession's building is probably a $64, $65 million building, and that's what's going forward to THEC. It's freeing up 35,000 square feet of space in six existing buildings. And when you think about those spaces and renovating those for, the, for uh, uh, other academic purposes, uh, that's about a $10 million project. So this is, both of these numbers are going to or have gone to THEC so that they're aware of it and it's part of the queue that's going to happen in terms of how they're gonna make some judgments about uh, funding these projects. So where might it go? As you look at the campus, um, right north of math computer science is a parking lot and we think that, that it a, is a great location for it. It's near the sciences. It's near Hemlock, it is easily accessible, and it's a perfect location for that, that building. So let's talk about the library. I think on most campuses today, the library is more frequently changing dramatically than any other building on campus, other than maybe the STEM sciences and so on. Uh, what used to be a warehouse for books is now becoming an active learning environment where student collaboration space is really the key, bringing students in. Students aren't really using the books as much as they, they had in the past. They're using the library in different ways. And this library, and as we looked at in comparison to the other institutions, this library is, is inadequate, too small, and it really is a 1940s library in the 21st century now, and we need to rethink the whole library structure. Unfortunately, it's in a great location. So we think that it should stay where it is and expand where it is, and you could build to, you could add an addition to the library, you can renovate the library, you might even be able to add another floor to the library, but it's a great location. So I, I think you could add to it, put things in it, put volumes in it if you want to, and then renovate the existing building. Uh, but, but the way in which the library is today is truly an inadequate resource for the students that are going to school here today. No longer is it it should it be acquired environment, nor should coffee and food not be available. Oh, and we're also seeing libraries putting in, um, you know, uh, maker spaces. So it's really becoming almost in a certain way a student center type of environment at the for the academic side of things. I also think that, at, I'll show you a different different uh, idea, but if that building, if, if Harville disappears, it could be the location for a student success center, which you might want to then tie back to the library. So let's look at the student success building. Um, there are several locations where you might think about where it would go, and, and I'll show you where I think it should go. But one location, unfortunately, is where Marx is, so I'd like to get rid of Marx, and if I could use, if I could use that as an excuse, why not? So uh, that's one place I would put it. Another place is north of, of the uh, uh, health professions building, and a third is where Harville is now. And in my mind, if you could tie that to the expanded library, it would make a great resource for your students. Um, university, uh, college and, and um, Marion are two highly used roads that, that are, need some sort of calming, calming, traffic calming devices, and there are ways of doing that without really changing the nature, but you change the characteristics of it to slow the traffic down. And those circles represent places where you might want to put some gateways and say, we've arrived at Austin P. I would like to see the roadway between Browning and the U Morgan University Center closed to traffic. Design it so it looks like a pedestrian walkway. You could design it so it looks that way, but still have emergency vehicles go, go, go across it. Um, but it is, it's, to, in my mind, it's a, it's a conflict of pedestrian and, you know, you have two academic buildings and an administrative buildings, students going back and forth all the time, 
and they're not really looking to see whether a car is coming there. Why not just make it look pedestrian and, and, and make it join the rest of the space? And actually, if you do that, you could also make that pedestrian uh, so that the whole greenway becomes one uh, interesting uh, pedestrian zone. So there's plenty of room on this campus for other buildings. And this is just simply showing where you might place new academic buildings undefined at this point. Um, housing, I think if you were to build some additional housing, one place on campus is in that location. Another location obviously is in the P3 if that was to move forward. Um, and that ties back to downtown. And um, I mean, my last discussion is, is on student life resources. You have three buildings that so far are really tied to student life. One is the bookstore, which is locating off campus and freeing out that space for something. One is the Red Barn, which is a interesting building. Uh, and one is the Morgan, which was designed for a smaller enrolled institution. Uh, it is basically at capacity now. And so how do you deal with these three buildings as a resource? So one, one thing that we thought about is potentially, supposing you were to take Arnas out of the Red Barn and freeing that up for something else and move them into the bookstore. And then you could take the housing that's north of that and turn that into the Arnas residential and landscape the inside. And all of that then becomes a Arnas college, should you want to do that. Another comment and another idea is not to do that, but to turn the bookstore vacated space into a dining resource as a way to take the pressure off of some of the dining and to alleviate, allevi alleviate some of the pressure that the uh, Morgan has today. So neither of those have been really vetted, but there are a couple of ideas that are on the table now that we're exploring. And um, that's really where we are. I will answer any questions or take any comments. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Yeah. One thing I thought was interesting is that we use our classrooms 27 hours a week on average. Yep. And that THEC's recommendation was no 30. more than thir yep. 30. I, don't, I just found that to be very low. It seems like a really good use of our money to use the classrooms more hours in a week. So, so why is that so So don't low? forget the 30 hours is just for looking at a 40-hour week. Right, so 10 hours are free. So, so the reason that, that THEC and almost, there are 27 states that have state standards on colleges and universities, they almost all say 30 hours per week. And the reason for that is you need to be able to um, give the registrar some flexibility for cleaning those rooms, for meeting, using them for meetings, for, for club meetings, and for, for other types of purposes. It's almost impossible, it's almost impossible to schedule a classroom 100% of the time. You, you might occasionally do that, but not across the whole inventory of classrooms. And do we have night classrooms? Oh, sure. Like we have yeah. like 6.30 yeah. classes and, and or 6 o'clock classes or things this, like that? There are no standards for an evening time. But, and we've, we looked at that, and I could show you a graphic that shows you are using your classrooms uh, in the evening as well. But the standards almost always look at the day for some reason. But but you are you are using your classrooms from almost from 7.30, 7.30 in the morning until about 10 at night. But we're just looking at that, that window where we could look at standards. So that 20, that 27 hour average, that was just daytime use. That That's correct. didn't include night and weekend That's correct. classes, okay? That's correct. And that, and that is the average. That means that there are some rooms that are certainly over, over 30 hours per week. In fact, there's one, I think, or two that are about 38 hours per week. I was curious, uh, a lot of those buildings, uh, when you're talking about where they could go possibly, uh, we're taking parking. Yep. Um, so is there any considerations on like the parking or where that? We, we have a, another firm that's working with us, Los Associates, who are looking at the whole circulation system and expanding different parking areas. Um, and that will be part of, of, the, of the eventual master plan, where we'll show where you can expand some of those parking locations. But it, it, I'm sorry, it's, it's, almost a, it's almost a rule of science that if you have a parking lot near an academic building, you're going to take that away and, and put another academic building there. Sorry. Um, I, I just like, you know, talking with my friends and stuff. Has there, any, has there been an, any ever, like, ideas about maybe a parking garage or something that could take up some of that space? There, there are, 
I'm still on, yeah. Um, a number of, uh, some of, of the six universities have parking garages now. I know Middle Tennessee, where we did the campus plan several years or so ago, I think they've added two, two campus arc, uh, parking garages. Um, they are expensive um, to build. Uh, they're also expensive in terms of the permitting that you might put in place for faculty, staff, and students. So just to give you a sense of scale, on-grade parking is about $2,500 a space. A parking deck, a parking garage, is about $27,000 a space, twenty to 27000 depending on what it would look like. Below-grade parking is about $40,000 a space. So it's hard to pay off a parking deck. You're going to subsidize it and swallow some of that cost if, in fact, you put it in place. And it could very well be that at some point we'll need to put a parking deck in place. Um, then, but how that's paid for, I think, is, in, is, is part of the, the, the discussion. By the way, you can, you can provide, the university can provide a lot of bicycles for one space. You know, $27,000, that's a lot of bikes if you want to do that. <laughs> um, a, a quick question for me. Uh, you talked about with the, cl the square footage in classrooms and, and the, the numbers reflected 2016 with the opening of the new art building and it's roughly 100,000 plus square feet, I think, I saw. I'm sorry. So that certainly helps it, us it, move towards the... It definitely does. And, and basically, it's adding some classroom space and it's adding some studio, some studio space. So that, that has a, a beneficial uh, in, impact. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Art. Thank you. Just a note on President White report earlier, uh, there's a report on interim items that can be referenced in, the, in your materials. Um, and at this time, I'd like to recognize Dr. Lynn Crosby, Vice Provost and Associate Vice President for Academic Affairs, to provide us with an update on SAC COC sub substantive change review process. Thank you, Chair O'Malley. I get tongue-tied saying that sometimes myself, too. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to provide you information in advance of the upcoming visit by the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools Commission on Colleges, otherwise referred to as SACCOC. This is due to the governance change, which is considered a substantive change, which is regulated by the U.S. Department of Education. Since March of 2016, the university has been participating in this substantive change process along with the five other universities. APSU's on-site visit by a SAC COC substantive change committee has been confirmed for October 3rd through 5th. The role of the SAC COC committee is to verify our compliance with accreditation standards as they relate to the governance change. In preparation for the visit, we have submitted to the committee a report and documentation for their review. We submitted that approximately a month ago. The committee that will be visiting us includes a four-person team of volunteers from out-of-state universities in the SAC COC region, along with our assigned vice president from the Commission on Colleges. The roster for that committee can be found in your information item in your board notebook today. You are asked to participate in this on-site visit. However, participation via video chat is acceptable for members, especially those who live out of town. We understand that due to your commitments, out-of-town board members may not be able to travel here and may not be able to participate in person. So for your consideration, you have options of participating in person, through video chat, or if necessary, not at all. However, we do need some of you to be here, so <laughs> including Chair O'Malley, if you could be here. The SAC COC committee chair has indicated the following dates and times are confirmed for their visit with you. 
Wednesday, October 4th, a luncheon from noon to 1.30, and then a meeting from 1.30 to 2.30. Both the luncheon and meeting will be held in this facility. In the information item that was provided to you, it said it was tentative, but I have received confirmation from the SAC COC committee chair. During the rest of their visit at the university, the SAC COC committee members will examine data and interview employees in order to ascertain whether the institution maintains their compliance with the SAC COC principles of accreditation, especially those that relate to the governance change. That committee will develop a consensus on its findings, draft a report, and then present an oral summary in an exit meeting with President White and invited institutional officials on their last day of the visit. The principles of accreditation most applicable to governing board operations are provided in the information item. Please, please rest assured that you are not expected to know the numbering of the SAC COC standards or to quote from the language of the SAC COC standards. I will share with you briefly each applicable standard for your review. There are relevant, consider, um, relevant questions for each standard that may help you prepare for the visit, and those are printed underneath each standard in the information item in your booklet. First, core requirement 2.2, governing board. The institution has a governing board with at least five members that is the legal body with specific authority over the institution. The board is an active policy-making board for the institution and is ultimately responsible for ensuring the financial resources of the institution are adequate for providing a sound educational program. The board is not controlled by a minority of its members or by organizations or interests separate from it. Both the presiding officer of the board and a majority of other voting members of the board are free of any contractual, employment, or personal or familial financial interest in the institution. Comprehensive Standard 3.2.1, CEO Evaluation and Selection. The governing board of the institution is responsible for the selection and periodic evaluation of the chief executive officer. Since I know that the SAC COC committee may be particularly interested in this standard, based on the experience of our colleagues around the state who have hosted these visits already, I'll mention these relevant consider questions for your consideration. How is the CEO selected and or appointed? What are the board's, board's criteria for determining an effective performance for the CEO? How is the CEO evaluated and what is the schedule? So you may be asked those kinds of questions. Please know that we will provide them documentation from today's meeting based on what you approved in that regard. Comprehensive Standard 3.2.2, Governing Board Control. The legal authority and operating control of the institution are clearly defined for the following areas within the university's governance structure the mission, the fiscal stability, and institutional policy. Comprehensive Standard 3.2.3, .3, Conflict of Interest. The Governing Board has a policy addressing conflict of interest for its members. Comprehensive Standard 3.2.4, .4, External Influence. The Governing Board is free from undue influence from political, religious, or other external bodies and protects the institution from such influence. Comprehensive Standard 3.2.5, Board Dismissal. The Governing Board has a policy whereby members can be dismissed only for appropriate reasons and by a fair process. And lastly, Comprehensive Standard 3.2.6, Board and Administration Distinction. There is a clear and appropriate distinction in writing and practice between the policymaking functions of the governing board and the responsibility of the administration and the faculty to administer and implement policy. I can now respond to any questions you might have about SAC-COC, 
the standards and or the upcoming visit. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, as a reminder, our next regularly scheduled meeting will take place November 30 and December 1st. Um, before I move that the meeting adjourn, let me offer some thanks to a, a, a few f people. Um, one, I think everybody in the room agrees that this facility is outstanding, notwithstanding uh, where it was when you left on, but I'm sure you, you two would agree it's a, a nice improvement. Um, uh, Dr. White, thank you as usual for, for uh, everything you do for us to make this an easier process than it otherwise could be. And certainly all of us are thankful to Donnell for the preparation and notes and, and uh, hurting us in the proper direction as needed. Um, and I also want to thank Penny Howard in the corner. Thank you, Penny, for all your work to get this meeting ready. Andy Keene, uh, who's in the back somewhere, and Judy Molnar for the work that you all do uh, to prepare this room, to prepare all of us, and uh, to ensure a successful meeting. Um, so with that, I move that the meeting adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Billy Atkins. It is moved and seconded that the meeting adjourn. All those in favor say aye. Any opposed, say no. The ayes have it. The meeting is adjourned.